Hello, everyone. Welcome to another International Relations Capsule for the Shankar IAS Academy. We have been celebrating Onam in Kerala and therefore we missed one class last week. My apologies. This time we will talk about BRICS. All of you know about BRICS. You have heard about it for a long time. Always wondering what its role was in the world. You know that this whole idea of BRIC, not BRICS, B-R-I-C, was invented by an American economist who said that there were very common, several common features between Brazil, uh, Russia, India, and China. And these are all large countries developing very fast, common economic problems, etc. But of course, politically, these are all very, very, very diverse. So he did not intend it to be an organization of any kind. But gradually, an idea emerged that there could be an organization called BRIC. And later, in order to include Africa also into the group, South Africa was invited. And that is how BRICS was formed. Initially, there was really no political glue uh, to keep all these countries together. And its mission was also not very, very clear. But the idea was that since these countries have similar experiences and similar problems, uh, they could get together and discuss some of these social and economic issues. So the summits started. And when you have an organization, it has a dynamism of its own. An agenda is found, discussion start. And uh, generally, it takes a line eventually in a particular direction, and then it grows. That is how international organizations are formed. But China saw an opportunity in this, which others did not perhaps. And they thought that could turn this organization into an anti-West organization uh, by challenging Western concepts of uh, economics, uh, particularly uh, the Bretton Woods institutions, uh, because they have been controlled by the United States and the Western world, and there could be a counter to that. And India itself had that view that the Bretton Woods institutions should be um, revitalized, more role for other countries to play, because in the, in the uh, World Bank and IMF, it is the biggest contributors who call the shots. It is not, they are not democratic organizations. So there was this sentiment generally, and China led this on to a, an anti-Western economic group, slowly and steadily, even though BRICS also discussed the other issues. So in the last few months, uh, maybe, a, maybe a year or so, there has been a move to develop, or at least uh, organize, uh, global South, uh, even during the ideological conflicts of the Cold War days, when the world was divided between East and West, there was some thinking about South and North also. For political division was East and West, while the economic division was North and South, because generally countries in the North are more prosperous than the countries in the South. And of course, the ideas of the uh, of this division was voiced by on the one side by G7, the most powerful countries in the world, and G77, because it is more than 77 countries, but still, for the as a counter to seven, it was called 77. And uh, discussions took place, and G77 worked closely with the non-aligned movement, and others had their own G7 meetings and so on. Uh, Russia joined G7 for a while, became G8, but soon Russia was removed and G7 went back to the same position. So in the world of economics, there was the G7 and the G77, and uh, negotiations took place and uh, they worked out some arrangements, but of course, neither was happy with the other's behavior, and this continued. And um, the summits, the BRICS summit used to be held, and uh, it was an opportunity for these five countries to exchange views, ideas, etc. And two things emerged 
One was the idea of a BRICS bank. Of course, very small, but eventually aiming to uh, counter uh, the Bretton Woods institution. That's what China had in mind. And the other countries went along with it. And then also, there was an idea of a development fund, fund for the BRICS countries, which is, of course, attractive. Not much money, but these two institutions grew. And slowly, China adopted a position of leadership in this group. They were, the Bretton Woods uh, countering the, the bank, which counters it, which is called the BRICS Bank, was established in China uh, with an Indian director. Because India was considered also as a venue, but China uh, you know, wanted it. And uh, so the director was from India, but the center was in, <clears throat> in China. So this was dragging on. Nothing much had happened except for the addition of South Africa. And nobody cared much about it at that time. But suddenly, there is a big interest in uh, a global south being developed. And uh, China, of course, was not in G77, but uh, they, there was an arrangement like China, G77 and China. China did not become a member, but supported generally the developing countries' agenda. So China being in it is nothing, not new, but Russia also a part of it. And so we have a new global south being formed. And uh, particularly after the start of the uh, Russia-Ukraine war, uh, they strengthened because uh, local international global problems in increased. There was also the climate change issue. There was the uh, question of, um, of the pandemic. So there were very many things that uh, the global south needed. And there was no particular organization for that because G77 was there, non-alignment was there, but they were a little bit old. And so a new thought occurred about a global south. And uh, many countries started speaking about it, the interests of the global south. And at the conference in uh, Johannesburg in South Africa recently, uh, both Russia and China, uh, together with South Africa, mooted a proposal to expand BRICS and uh, started uh, sound, sounding out other countries, other developing countries, important developing countries, so that uh, BRICS could be representative of a bigger group of countries. You know, so many, about 22 countries applied. We were against it. India was against it in the beginning because of the fear that Pakistan might be brought in in some form. And we are fed up of multilateral organizations with uh, Pakistan raising Kashmir issue everywhere. So we were against it. But in the process of this discussion, it was decided that it would be only on the basis of uh, uh, consensus, and uh, we opposed uh, Pakistan, and therefore Pakistan was left out. And uh, a general selection was made. In Latin America, we needed a representation, so Argentina was brought in. Uh, then, um, uh, then of the Arab countries, Saudi Arabia uh, and UAE, and also from the same region, Iran came in, and Egypt. So these six countries were uh, invited to join with the opportunity for others to apply 22 of them uh, to negotiate their way into the uh, BRICS in the, in the new course. So the six countries with this six and the old five now it is, uh, it is BRICS 11, uh, which took certain decisions in, uh, in Johannesburg. Uh, basically what BRICS had been saying earlier, but with a greater authority and so on because uh, Two big powers are there, Russia and China. And uh, major powers from all parts of the continent or the, or the world were there. So it assumed certain legitimacy and a certain clout. But it's too early for them to make demands uh, on uh, the developed world. And so they were sounding out what to do. Uh, one of the things they did uh, was the, in the final declaration Two or three important things. Uh, uh, first was this whole ex uh, idea of expansion of BRICS. So 
the others will also be brought in. So it is possible that by the next time, by the time the next summit takes place, there will be some more countries in this. So it is gaining some kind of uh, legitimacy and importance. So one of the things they did was to reiterate the support that uh, BRICS had given to India, Brazil, uh, and uh, South Africa to become permanent members of the Security Council. And uh, for BRICS to say that was fine. But now with two permanent members in the organization, it may have been difficult for them to say so. And even if they said so, they would not have meant it. So, but in spite of that, they allowed that reference to be made that uh, this organization, BRICS 11, supports India, Brazil, and uh, South Africa for permanent membership. But I do not see any hope for that because Russia and China, when I say it in this group, but outside it, they will oppose any expansion of the permanent membership. In fact, permanent members are not the only ones who are object to such expansion. The majority of the member states are not in favor, as that also we know. So that is more a formality. And the other important thing that they discussed and came to some conclusion was about using of a currency for the group and also de dollarize the economy of the world, economies of the world. And this is something which is being discussed, and China has been very ambitious in this. And they have been wanting the yuan to become the global currency rather than the dollar, in the expectation that they would overtake China or United States one of these days. They had that hope during the pandemic. They thought China, United States was disappearing and China should take over the lead. But that did not happen, of course. And still they have this intention. And so they floated this idea in this group as to whether they could have their own currency, whether BRICS could have its own currency. But Naturally, others did not support it. So the agreement that was that came about was uh, that uh, the, the members of BRICS 11 could trade with each other in their own currencies. That's an option that everybody has. We had it with ruble, current, ruble trade with the uh, uh, Soviet Union. We recently signed an agreement with UAE, and UAE happens to be now in, the, in BRICS. So there's nothing unusual. They could decide on selling and buying goods in their own currencies. But it did not take the form of a uh, regular currency for the world or even a compulsory currency for BRICS itself. So the uh, East-West divide, while it remains, now has a powerful North-South divide also. And uh, the, this organization will keep take on uh, many agenda items that BRICS had dealt with. And it will be generally uh, a grouping of developed, developing countries to fight the develop, developed countries for uh, the development of the developing countries. And uh, demands will be made, negotiations will be made. So, East-West, North-South negotiations will be possible for a new world. So the significance of this uh, BRICS 11 is that in a way, it has contributed substantially to the new world order that we are all thinking about. Because at the, at the moment, there is no world order because uh, people are, are not respecting all the uh, resolutions and decisions of the United Nations or these groups themselves. And even bilateral agreements, like China have refuted all the uh, bilateral agreements that signed with, with India. Uh, so uh, a new world order is necessary. And uh, the first shot about this, this was done by United States uh, by offering India uh, the privileges of uh, an ally, even without India becoming a member of NATO or even allowing the Quad to become a military bloc. So India had refused it, but uh, suddenly because of its problems with China, the United States decided to offer us a large amount of technology and equipment and even weapons, which are normally provided only to NATO countries. So 
we became like a, a non-NATO ally of the United States. So one brick has been laid for the uh, global, the blue, new global order. So in the sense that it is now established that the differences will be between democracies, because the quad are all democracies, and uh, the uh, autocracies, with Russia and China having signed a, a solid agreement between them. So that is how the new world war, war was emerging. And uh, India now was very close to the United States, having accepted the new offers. And um, it, it was quite natural for India to be among the democracies. But now the issue is that uh, uh, Russia and China are also in this group. And uh, therefore, these big powers interests will come in. And uh, what they will do is to expand the uh, BRICS to a much bigger number and then try to form as the voice of the global south. This is the consequence of this. Uh, but whether this is good or not, whether it will be useful for us or not, are all these questions which are confronting us. Uh, because when this uh, new uh, organization uh, becomes strong, with Russia and China in it, is a new thing that for the developing world has got uh, two big countries in it. And therefore, this is this will be a different uh, uh, BRICS. Um, so the China's, Chinese have seen it, seeing it as a new opportunity. And they think that uh, with the support of Russia also and others, they would be able to counter uh, the uh, Bretton and Woods institutions. And uh, at the moment, it is still very unclear. Uh, the, the expansion itself is uh, not final because they have said that the others can also be considered. So it will be a bigger organization. And whether this bigger organization will be more helpful uh, for the uh, grouping is something to be seen. Because when you have a bigger group and that to such a heterogeneous group, and that assumes the importance of the global south, how will decisions be taken? Because both Russia and China will throw their weight around and try to get things for done for themselves. And the smaller countries, you know, like Ethiopia and so on, what will they do in this group? So maybe a smaller group with the stronger members would have been a better thing. Because the G77 became very diluted, like the normal line became very diluted. Because if everybody joins the normal line movement, then what happens to the ideology? Similarly, if everybody joins G77. So those countries, Russia and China, which are out of it, is now in the group, whether it will be helpful or whether there will be conflict inside is the question to be answered. Of course, it is quite possible that uh, this will happen because they will build an influence and uh, it may become a bit of a headache to uh, India and generally a problem with the organization itself. So it will become the unity of BRICS will become very important, how it develops and who takes what side, etc. So far, that was not an issue. Within these five countries, all of them were operating more or less individually. Um, so the new countries which have joined are fairly, uh, you know, uh, harmless because they all have uh, interest in the developing countries and they are growing fast. But others like Nigeria and Kenya were also very keen to join. And uh, since they were both fighting with each other, they took Ethiopia rather than either of them. Uh, Saudi Arabia joining and uh, UAE is joining and Iran joining, which has a Middle East uh, strength also. And they will naturally be uh, working in the interests of the developing countries of the, of the Middle East.
So uh, the decisions regarding the Security Council and uh, the currency are significant, but uh, it is still very, very tentative. And uh, you know, we do not know what shape it takes. And then the question of uh, the future of BRICS is also a big question, because none of us can uh, uh, guess how this will turn out, because China and Russia are in BRICS. And um, now China and Russia may try to bring in more countries into it. And uh, the idea of a global south may or may, may not emerge from this group. Because some countries may want to uh, have a uh, South group without Russia and China. But Russia and China have uh, you know, used BRICS in order to establish themselves in this new organization. And they are not going to let it go. So suddenly BRICS has become an important uh, organization, number one. And then secondly, its unity is going to be very difficult to maintain. And thirdly, uh, the, it all depends on how many other countries will join and push the agenda around. But certainly this is a contribution to the new world order which is emerging. Uh, if the world accepts uh, BRICS as a global south and starts consulting it, and the global north uh, considers it a, a competent partner, then things may be better. But as of now, we do not know whether it will become the Global South or continue to be another organization which may not have much to do in world affairs. So this has to be seen. We have a stake in this because we have been associated with BRICS from right from the beginning. And we had wanted also that there should be an organization which reflects the thoughts of the South. So India will be keenly watching. What happened in Johannesburg was not against our interests because the two decisions taken were more or less in our line of thinking and the expansion has also not been hostile to us. So we have to watch and see what BRICS 11 will bring to the world. Well, India has very friendly relations with Latin American countries for a long time. But the distance was always a factor. Even though people had reached there, and there were cultural linkages. There are many Latin American countries which are uh, you know, spiritually oriented. They have interest in our gurus and so on. Then literature, Latin American literature, music, etc. have been popular in India. And so there are many linkages. Uh, but I mentioned Latin America in the context of having one more Latin American country. Brazil was already, is already there, but it is not Spanish-speaking. So they probably felt that uh, another Latin American country, which is Spanish-speaking, should also be in this group. So there's no problem for us with the equation with Argentina or Brazil. Uh, but they were included to give geographical uh, representation. And uh, both the countries will have many new ideas to offer. Well, it's a moderate African country, and we have good relations, as you say. So it will serve. It will not be against our interests, and I'm sure our old ties with uh, Haley Selassie and all that may probably come out again when we negotiate with them. But it's a good addition. But they were added simply because Kenya and uh, uh, was Nigeria were fighting for one seat, and uh, so they decided to give it to Ethiopia. But of course, Kenya and uh, Nigeria will also come in subsequently. And Ethiopia is a good country for us. Yes, this is what uh, I anticipated. And I said that uh, to have Russia and China as part of the developing South is not very comfortable. Because even when I used to say that uh, these BRICS, two non-vegetarians and three vegetarians, you know, two big powers and three comparatively smaller powers, how is it going to work? I used to ask that question in the initial stages. And China began dominating it. So, and China wanted to expand it also, and we uh, were re reluctant to do that. 
but we agreed. Our consideration there was that uh, China, Pakistan will not be allowed. <laughs> and also, it was probably a deal. We would not have liked Pakistan to be also in this group. So, since that was conceded, we may have conceded on the other countries. But we have not heard the last of the uh, expansion. Expansion may take place and more and more, and uh, uh, the BRICS 11 will keep changing. We have to watch out for that. Because as far as domination is concerned, China will try, and China and Russia are together these days, and therefore there will be a formidable uh, group inside the BRICS. More African countries are interested to join the group. Can you give a small brief about Indian and Chinese influence in the continent? Well, we have been talking about it for a long time. Quite clearly, India's position in Africa has been undermined by China. In fact, it was undermined during my days in Africa, in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya. At that time, the major uh, countries which were assisting Africa and uh, trying to take Africa away from us uh, were uh, Japan and Korea, not China. So we were, in a sense, struggling with uh, Japan and Korea in our relations with, China, with uh, uh, Nairobi, with Kenya. And I remember when we were contesting against Japan for the Security Council membership, non-permanent membership, and uh, I approached the president of Kenya for the vote. And uh, he, of course, hummed and hawed, but he finally told me that, uh, you know, China, Japan has a very major assistance program to Kenya amounting to something like, I don't remember the exact figure, something like $250 million. And what he was suggesting was, would India be able to give that? If they give us the vote, you know, Africans see it in that manner. So naturally, I did not encourage a discussion on that score, uh, because I know that we don't have that kind of money to give. But I talked more about our cultural relation, the Indian diaspora there, and all these are common interests. But Kenya did not vote for us, it was very clear. And um, so that was the issue at that time. But now things have changed further. Japanese and Koreans have also become minor players when, when China has virtually taken over Africa, uh, practically because of the all the mineral wealth that is in the continent. And their hunger for uh, uh, these minerals because technology development. China needs a lot of these minerals and they are willing to uh, you know, give assistance, do whatever they want in order to capture that. And initially, Africans have not been very wise. They were making signing contracts at low prices, accepting gifts from them, like uh, schools, and, schools and stadia and hospitals and so on, as part of the Belt and Road Initiative also, a lot of money was sanctioned to several African countries. But they have now discovered that these are all debt traps and also the kind of resources they are giving to these countries are things which are not in use, you know, in excess in, in China. Whether it is people or equipment, etc., which were not usable in China, they were gifting it away to the Africans. So that is being found out and some African countries have uh, try to get out of the Chinese stronghold. Uh, but that's not easy. Once you join with them, the hold will tighten. Uh, and India does not have that kind of record. We are still remaining there. Uh, there are very many uh, reports and statements by African leaders which seem to suggest that uh, the next is going to be Indian Africa or Indian century in Africa. I do not see it happening because I myself seen the attitude of many African states to India vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis the West, etc. They have no, nothing against us, but they feel that technology is better abroad in Europe or scholarships are better. And therefore, they make use of our assistance program only when they have nothing else you know, to carry on with. So it, I'm not so optimistic that uh, India's relationship with uh, Africa will develop very quickly. But I have some of my own colleagues writing books saying that this is going to happen. So, but um, the Chinese are not going to let it go so easily. 
and now Russians also will work with the Chinese. And so we will have a tough time to deal with China and sorry, with Africa. And, um, and suddenly it be our traditional relationships etc. will help in terms of what we at the moment do that. We have very small assistance program, but we have also got a several several credit lines given to African countries. But what happens is they don't even use these credit lines because if they use these credit lines, they have to get people and equipment from India if they use India's credit lines. But if they use Western credit lines, they can go to study in America, they can go to Europe, and they get more money as scholarship, etc. So there again, there is a little bit of a balance for India. But um, I, I suppose they will see the value of staying close to India after they have been through all these experiences. Thank you.